Good morning. Uh, welcome to a UK column interview. Um, I'm Brian Gerrish. I'm delighted to say I'm at home this morning, so I'm going to be doing this interview in a very relaxed style. Um, my guest today is David Curtin, who is the leader of the Heritage Party. And uh, I think this is going to be a very fascinating interview, as I've just shared with uh, uh, David when we were just having a little bit of an informal chat. Uh, the UK column has been approached over the last couple of months by a number of people involved with new parties. And uh, we've done a couple of interviews already to date. We're very happy to do more. And uh, what I'm going to try and make sure I do from here on is give everybody a fair crack of the whip. So I'm going to try and judge my questions and how, how we discuss areas uh, in a way that's going to be fair to the Heritage Party and hopefully to other new parties that uh, would like an interview with the UK column. So, David, having given that little bit of a spiel, welcome to UK column. Thank you, Brian. Really good to join you on UK Column. I love what you do. You know, I, I don't have time to hear everything you do because you do so much every week. But, you know, you put the truth out there. And, uh, you know, to me, actually, you're, you're a fantastic source of information about um, all the things that are going on. So, so thanks for all you're doing. So let's start off with you. Tell us about yourself. How did you get involved in all this? Gosh, I don't know how far to go back. I guess I'd start at the very beginning and just work through because, you know, I was just minding my own business. I was a chemistry teacher for a long time, um, but I'd always been interested in politics and current affairs and culture and where it was going and so on. And I got actively involved in politics, I guess, about... 2012, 2013, around then, because I was really concerned about two big things in particular. One was the European Union and how it was undermining democracy, and also uh, political correctness and how it was undermining freedom and our culture, and uh, you know just the way that people are able to re interact with each other normally and you know share a joke and share a bit of banter. So you know back in the day at the time I joined UKIP um, because it was the only party that was around that seemed to be uh, fighting and campaigning against both those things. Wanted to leave the European Union, but also um, wanted to allow people the freedom just to carry on speaking as they'd already done and was against political correctness. So I joined up there and um, I stood in my first election in 2015. Uh, that was the election that UKIP you know, got, what was it? they got one in every eight votes, but they only got one seat. So uh, that really wasn't a fair system. But, you know, I stood in Camberwell in Peckham against Harriet Harman, who's famous for bringing in the Equality Bill, which is, um, or the Equality Act, which is a, is a complete disaster as well. So I was glad to do that. Um, but then I was selected the next year to stand in the London Assembly elections. And so I, I was just blessed and fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. I got elected onto the London Assembly um, and I was there for five years. Um, soon after I was elected was the referendum. As well, of course, we know the result for that. We voted to leave the European Union. But in terms of politics, um, UKIP then pretty much collapsed. It's it's it started to collapse very, very soon after the referendum. You know, Farage left, there was a leader, another leader, another leader. They've had about 10 leaders in five years, and it's just like it's it's kind of you know imploded, which was very, very sad because I hoped to you know help to change UKIP into a proper socially conservative party which the country needed but it didn't do that there was too much infighting so I left um while I was still on the London Assembly but I I was you know use that time to question Sadiq Khan uh, an awful lot and because uh, there's a lot to question there uh, and you know because I was pretty free to do whatever I wanted there was no one whipping me telling me that I couldn't say this I couldn't say that I could ask Sadiq Khan all the questions I wanted to ask and all the questions that everybody else pretty much wanted to, him to be asked you know I could ask him about grooming gangs for example why are you not investigating grooming gangs in London um, why why are you putting out tweets about uh, transgenderism? You know, uh, why are you supporting this and that and the other? And, you know, why are you allowing the police to go in and, um, 
crack down on freedom protesters, but then giving a green pass to Black Lives Matter um, protests and uh, Muslim uh, celebrations and so on at the same time. I could ask him that and he didn't have a good answer. So I had a really good run of five years in the London Assembly doing that. But at the same time, I was kind of politically homeless as well. So I was independent. But then I started the Heritage Party because I thought, look, I just need to do this and get off my backside and actually start something um, which I think the country needs, you know, a, a real socially conservative party. So um, it, it was about the, the start of the lockdown, actually. I started working on it and we did a lot of... Um, you know, background work, getting everything ready, and then launched in September 2020, you know, just around the same time as the big protests in Trafalgar Square um, were were coming out against lockdowns and so on. That's when we launched. So the Heritage Party has been going now two and a half years. And um, I'm so happy, you know, that that we've been joined by some amazing people. And, you know, we're growing. Obviously, we've got elections coming up and so on. So we're we're just trying to to be the party with the policies and principles that the country needs. Just what everyone would have thought was common sense about 30 or 40 years ago. But um, you always get smeared by the mainstream media and the other parties just for saying simple common sense things like, you know, for example, there's two sexes, male and female. <laughs> you cannot become a woman if you're a man. All these kind of things that they want to shut you down from saying. So, you know, the world's gone mad, but we're really trying to just turn it the right way up in the political sphere. So in a nutshell, that's what we're about. Tell us what the Heritage Party stands for. Yeah, we have a strap line, which is freedom, family, nation. You know, I think people can remember those three words. And, you know, most of our principles would hang on those things. So we're about restoring freedom. Because obviously, over the last three years, we've seen freedom being absolutely hammered and corroded actively. We've had tyranny in this country in a manner that we couldn't even imagine, you know, five years ago. So we're about all, all kinds of our fundamental freedoms need to be restored and need to be protected. Free speech, freedom of assembly, freedom to protest, freedom freedom to trade, freedom to move around your own country if you're a citizen, you know, with which, you know, it speaks into these uh, agenda 2030 low traffic neighborhoods and 15 minute cities that we've got now. So the, the basic principle is that we support freedom. Um, family as well. We're for traditional family values. So um, this is the why we're a socially conservative party. You know, we, we say, I ask our candidates three things, you know, because there's three fundamental socially conservative positions that we would take. Not everyone agrees with them, but one is that there's two sexes, male and female, um, you cannot change your sex. So if you want to dress up as the opposite sex, that's fair enough. You can do that. But it doesn't make you actually the opposite sex. So no one should be forced to affirm this. And there shouldn't be anything in law that says you have to recognize um, this idea of gender, which is different to sex, which is really a social construct that came out of the left field um, American universities in the 50s and 60s, and this has spread around the world through the institution. So that's one of our um, principles, if you like, and our, our policies would, would hang off that. The other is that um, we believe in the traditional family. Marriage is a man and a woman. It's not a man and a man or a woman and a woman, or as some countries are trying to introduce polyamorous marriages as well, and you also have polygamous marriages. We don't accept that. Um, it's a man and a woman. And so we would repeal the Same-Sex Marriage Act 2013, because I don't think that children should be deliberately put in a place where they are brought up by same-sex couples. I don't think that's right for children, because um, children on every measure do better if they are with a married um, mother and father, their own married mother and father. So that's traditional family values that we stand for. Um, also, we're a pro-life party, so we're against abortion. Um, we say that life begins at conception and uh, unborn children have the right to life. So, you know, that would sort of go along with that. And we ask our candidates, you know, if you would vote for those things, you don't have to agree personally. Some people can become candidates, but they say, OK, well, I don't agree with, like, you know, 100 percent of stuff. They're happy to vote for it. But, you know, and that's fine. Some people don't. But 
you know, we would expect candidates to vote for those things if they got into parliament. So those are our policies to do with family and nation, of course, you know, um, I started this in 2020, so Brexit was still pretty much a, a live issue then. Um, we'd sort of half had it, but it hadn't been done properly. So, you know, what I would say is that we should be fully coming out of all of the influences of the European Union. We're still stuck in uh, a lot of the, you know, programmes, de facto stuck in the programmes that we had, like the common fisheries policy. We don't have control over our fishing waters. We don't have control over Northern Ireland. Who knows what's going on with the moment with this Windsor agreement that they're talking about. Out. You know, they're selling it to the public, but I think more needs to be done there. And uh, we certainly haven't got control over our borders, um, which is deliberate. So, you know, the, the fake Conservative Party are bringing in um, tens of thousands of military maged men every year, and they're not stopping them. But we need to be able to get out of any global um, compacts, arrangements and agreements that we are in that stop us from controlling our borders because you don't have national sovereignty if you can't control your borders. So there's those kind of things that, that go with nation as well, as well as being proud of your nation. You know, I know there are some bad things in the past, but, you know, there's bad things in the past of every nation. But essentially, on balance, we're a good nation. And we should be proud of our culture and our heritage and not destroying it, as some people are actively trying to do by changing roadside names and taking down statues and um, and also destroying the historic buildings, knocking them down and then building these hideous carbuncles over the place on programs of densification and intensification around railway hubs that you see, you know, in, in so many towns and cities now that used to be, you know, pleasant and relaxed and quiet. And they're now just these hideous kind of um, unhuman places with horrible square blocks everywhere. You know, that's that's destroying the physical fabric of the nation as well as the um, culture and the society and the heritage of the nation. So we want to protect that and defend that and rebuild that up again. So, you know, those three words, you can hang the manifesto on that. You know, it's a manifesto of positive principles. And then on that, you know, would, would our policies would flow uh, from the principles in our manifesto as well. Well, a very good overview of where you've come from. And again, I've got a lot of thoughts going through my head. head. So I've got questions. But just one more question on the party um so what about candidates then you're you're setting yourselves up for the may elections coming up are you able able to tell us how many candidates you're going to put out and um how easy it's been or difficult it's been to get those candidates yeah um, well we the first time we stood was two years ago we had about 30 candidates then we didn't have as many last year we had about 20 but there weren't elections in as many places now i can't say exactly how many we're going to have it would be somewhere in the region of 50 to 100 i think we're going to have this year maybe more it depends on how many people apply and you know apply to stand uh, over this month because obviously the nomination period starts around the May, March the 20, 29th or something, and it ends on the 4th of April. So everyone has to get their nomination papers into the councils by the 4th of April or you know, you're not at the ballot paper. So, you know, there's a there's a change there. Um, so, yeah, so we're, we're still in the, in the process of um, selecting candidates, approving candidates and, and finding spots uh the candidates want to stand in so that's ongoing um but you know all i can say is i'm really happy with the ones that we do have who have come to us already they're really really good quality of candidate and um we're going to have them in many many more places than we did before and it's you know we're just building up every year um until whenever the next general election happens and uh so it, it, it depends on, you know, people getting involved. That's the thing. So, so we've had a lot of people come to us, so especially over the last six months and have joined. But, you know, people, a lot of people who've joined us have never been involved in politics before. And uh, it's a big step for people to 
go from never being involved in politics to joining a party to then standing as a candidate. But, you know, what I say to people is just it's not that hard at local elections. You know, just just go for it. You can be what is colloquially known as a paper candidate where you just fill in your forms and you don't have to do an awful lot of campaigning. Don't worry about, you know, how much time you need to put in. Just stand because that's a service to people in your area to give them a chance to vote for somebody who's not Tory, Labour, Lib Dem, Green, SNP, who are pushing the globalist agenda. And we can try to get people into our local councils who are on the side of the people. So, you know, it's um, it's a big step for people, but people are taking that step. And I'm, I, you know, encourage everyone to, to go and do that. This is a really good point that um, you are um, encouraging. And I'd imagine giving a little bit of teaching to uh, people mm. to say if you want to get involved in if you want to get involved and you want to get involved in politics um you've got to understand a bit about the procedures my personal experience um and i'm smiling I'm laughing at myself really as i say this is that i first of all became a parish councillor and um that was uh some friends said to me one day oh do you know that they're looking for a parish councillor and you'd be good. We think you'd be good. And why don't you give it a go? And so I experienced the thrill of um, of parish elections. I got myself elected onto the parish council. And then it got very interesting because I found that I had access to documents that were provided by the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, so, so we got the parish council and then you've got your local district council. So documents were provided by the district council, which I probably would never have seen. It was only being there on the parish council and getting documents about transport and house building and, and uh, a number of other publications that I started to think to myself, well, actually, there's a bit more to this than I thought. So I, I can say I learned a lot from I think I was a parish councillor for six years. And then my joke is that, of course, most of what you get is complaints and problems and, and yeah. why don't you sort this out? Um, so I did my best to sort out some problems. I, I certainly had some success with, um, at, at that stage in my village, we didn't have a pavement the full length of the village, even though mm. traffic was getting heavier. And one of the things that I was able to achieve was a pavement from one end of the village to the other, uh, which was wide enough for pushchairs and prams. And we also had some safer crossings put in. So I, I am able to say I achieved some things. But in six years, I had a lot of letters which were a pack of trouble, some of them a bit hostile. But I did get one thank you letter. So my response to you is I learned a lot from getting involved. And then that led ultimately to to me ultimately standing as an independent candidate, um, uh, as a parliamentary candidate um, in Plymouth. And whilst I can't remember how many votes I got, I think about two, I think it was 232 or something like that. Mm. Uh, we did a lot of canvassing work. Um, and the next morning, uh, after the election, uh, I was having a coffee, feeling very tired and a bit depressed because I knew that I'd only got that couple of hundred votes. And a person called me and said, how are you this morning, Brian? And I said, a bit tired and a bit down. She said, why are you down? And I said, well, obviously, I didn't get elected. And he said, yeah, but do you know the news? And I said, well, no, I don't know the final result. And he said, well, Linda Gilroy Labour lost her seat and the Lib Dem got in. This was the seat that I, I was applying for. And uh, he said, you are the most hated man in Plymouth because everybody <laughs> believed that you disrupted the normal flow of the elections and hence Labour lost the seat. And this <laughs> taught me something else, that even when you think you haven't made an impact, you might well have. So I, I'm, I'm going to reflect back to you. Well done for encouraging people to get involved. But here's, here's a difficult question for you. What do you say to people who are perhaps new, they're just hearing about the Heritage Party, and they say, well, the trouble is, you know, David, that really nobody knows about the Heritage Party. So what do you think you're going to be able to do? You're so small. How do you, how do you respond to that? 
Yeah, well, I get asked that kind of question quite a lot. But the thing is, you know, we're new as well. So it's early days yet. We've been going two and a half years. And, you know, some of the other parties that we now know are household names. You know, UKIP obviously rose and then fell again, but it got to its... Um, height said uh, between 2012 and 2016 it was very successful in that period i mean it started in 1993 so it took about 20 years to get to the point where they were having the impact and you know arguably they were responsible for the biggest shift in politics ever in you know in in living memory with with winning the referendum fighting for it getting it winning it and sadly they have gone but they did have a massive impact i want to do more than just have an impact on the other two parties i'm aiming over the long term to grow and be a party that can stand everywhere and will take seats and you know hopefully in the long term or medium term we can be the party of government because i think that we are in a unique time now where people are just getting to the point where they're absolutely fed up of both the fake conservatives who are not conservative and the Labour Party because they don't represent the labouring man and they're just interested in wokery and transgenderism and all this kind of stuff and they're both acting together to ruin our energy infrastructure and uh, make energy costs more for businesses and households in the name of climate alarmism. And that just is completely out of touch with ordinary people who just want to get on with their lives, be able to pay their bills, look after their families, do their business and, and get on with things without government interfering. So I think we're nearing a point which is going to be a real um, interesting turning point in politics in this country where people will abandon all of the previous parties and look for something new. And we're here with positive principles to restore our nation and build up our nation again. So, yeah, we're small at the moment, but you know what? Oak, oak, oak trees grow out of acorns, don't they? They start small and then they grow and then they become the biggest tree in the forest. And And also, you know, David beat Goliath. <laughs> you can say it's like David and Goliath, but David won. And uh, I'm David. <laughs> so, you know, uh, so we are um, maybe small at the moment, but we are growing and we've got some fantastic people. Every year we're standing more candidates and um, we aim to make a difference. And if you don't try, you're not going to succeed. So I would say yeah. be positive. Look at what we've done so far and look at what we can achieve in the future rather than saying, oh, you're too small to do anything. Um, you know, join us and help us grow. <laughs> OK. And and of course, um, one of the things is that just just to say UKIP didn't actually achieve uh, an MP, if I remember correctly, did they? And and uh, this is something that I thought was always a shame for the amount of effort put in, um, mm. because even one MP asking the right questions in Westminster becomes a, a force uh, to be reckoned with, I think. So, um, yes, OK, I, I take that. And the next thing that occurs to me is that you, you're being pretty upfront, obviously, in, in your policies. And there's some of these policies that to the establishment at large at the moment, uh, these these have got a big black spot against them. Um, it's very difficult to talk about matters black and white, cultural issues. It's difficult to talk about immigration. It's certainly difficult at the moment to talk about um, uh, is it just a man and a woman that should be married? And you've you've come straight in with these topics. What sort of reaction are you getting? I, I can say from two areas. What sort of reaction are you getting to these policies from the media? And the other one is what sort of what sort of reactions are you getting from? I'll call it you know the political, um, the lower level political establishment. And by that I would be saying are you getting any feel for how you're seen by city councils or district councils county councils how are people reacting to your policies i think the most reaction i got was back when i was on the london assembly because then i was elected to something so you get more attention from the media when you're in an elected position and uh they hated what i would say you know they would just smear me as a homophobe or a bigot or uh, an anti-vaxxer or a conspiracy theorist all the time you know now i'm against uh, escalating war in ukraine i get called a putin puppet you know or they make up new smears every year for the the latest thing but 
Yeah, I remember one time in the London Assembly where there was a motion um, pr uh, um, proposed by a Labour um, Assembly member to support LGBT relationships and sex education in primary schools. And they all supported it except me. And I just stood up and I gave a speech and I said, I don't think this is right. Uh, there's Christian parents against it. There's Muslim parents against it. There's Jewish parents against it. We need to respect those groups and people who don't want this. And we should allow parents to uh, be the primary educators of their children. And one by one, they all got up and condemned me and they clapped each other for speaking against me. I mean, there was a Labour person, a Green person, a, a Tory person. They all stood up one after the other to, to speak against me. And, you know, they were united in condemning me for having the wrong opinion. They were really, really viscerally um, emotionally <laughs> attacking me. Uh, so there was there was it was it wasn't a rational the speeches they gave weren't rational, they were very visceral. So you, you could see this um, when I just stood up for trans to traditional family values. Um, you know, wh when I first said this, it, it was in 2017. And uh, I, yeah, there was an article about me in Pink News, which was picked up by The Sun and The Mirror. And they were all sort of saying, oh, here's someone with homophobic views. You know, So um, that, that's the kind of thing you get. But I, I think now, because I'm known for saying this and standing for this, I, at the moment, the, the mainstream media just seems to ignore me and doesn't doesn't really say much about um, what I say, uh, you know, and just um, uh, leaves me alone because I'd always give a good account and a good reason for, you know, why I have these policies and why I have these views. And I, and I also say, well, you know, all the other parties stand for those things. Voters need a choice. So I'm giving people a choice to vote for a socially conservative party because if someone wants to vote for that, they don't have the choice because the yeah. conservatives are not socially conservative. They're socially liberal, the same as Labour, Lib Dem, SNP and, um, and the Greens. You know, you've you got the problem at the moment. You can see Kate Forbes, you know, who's also a Christian. I'm a Christian. She's a Christian, which, you know, has these these uh, points of view. And she's getting hounded at the moment by the other people in her party and the mainstream media. And, and I relate to that because that's what happened to me in 2017 2018 2019 but it doesn't happen as much at the moment but i think if we started to win seats then you know the mainstream media would come back and have another go again um but i'll be ready for them <laughs> do, do you have any interaction or feedback from this I've, I've particularly talking about local council level here because one of the things that i learned and i'm sure Ply plymouth isn't different is that local politics is actually pretty dirty. If people think all of the dirt exists at high level with national politics, um, that dirt um, infests county councils, city councils, and local mm -hmm. district councils. As uh, some of it is is quite poisonous. So I, my mind says, have they already got their um, talent sharpened to come after you, or are they they also leaving you alone at the moment? I think at the moment most most people are leaving us alone um, because we you know we're we're not standing yet in all local councils. So there's some some places where we're not seen as a threat to them yet. There are some where we are, you know, where we're going to stand a number of councillors. Uh, this year. So people are sizing us up and get, getting a little bit worried about the, the challenge that we're going to bring in certain councils. You know, we're, we're going to stand quite a few uh, candidates in Devon, quite a few candidates in Surrey and Sussex and so on. So I think there, some of them might be a little bit more worried about uh, what we're going to do in the challenge that, that we bring. But on the other hand, we do have some people that were in the Conservative Party or are still in the Conservative Party and really hate it. They really absolutely hate what they're doing and where they're going. And they're looking at us and they really like what we're about and what we say and our, our policies and our principles and our manifesto. It, you know, we, we've had already a couple of people have come over. Uh, who have left the Conservative Party and, and want to join us. And we've got a number of other people who've said, well, we're thinking about it, you know, but they're still, you know, hanging on, hoping for the Conservative Party to change. I say, look, it's not going to change. So, you know, some of them are thinking of coming over. So we, we get those 
two different reactions. Um, but, you know, lo local politics, I think what people really don't like is that we are for um, you know, stopping lots of big planning developments. I mean, we want to maintain our heritage, you know, the, the beautiful historic character of our cities um, and towns and, and protect our countryside. So we would be against these huge development um, schemes that, that seem to go on. Uh, from which I, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of local councillors uh, benefit from with brown envelopes. Obviously, I don't know any specific examples, but, you know, this, this stuff goes on and we would be a challenge to that. So I think some people uh, are not going to like that. If we come along and say, no, we're not going to let these developments happen. We're going to protect our farmland. We're going to protect our, our historic buildings. And we're not going to allow uh, loads of developments to, to take place. Uh, because we're for our heritage and not for um, people making a quick buck. When anybody stands up to challenge what's happening, particularly if they challenge what they believe to be wrong, um, what immediately happens is, in my experience, is a big pushback. And you really have to fight hard before other people will come out of woodwork to say, yeah, actually, I think you're right and I'm going to support you. So I think I think where we're getting to is, yeah, politics is a very tough business and mm -hmm. um, it's not for the faint hearted. If you want to make a difference and get involved, wherever you decide to get involved, uh, you're going to have to fight your corner very hard. You've obviously got the advantage, David, of this experience with UKIP and, and getting up um, to, the, to the top of the tree with UKIP and your experience in London. And, uh, and I'm I would feel, you know, that that's that's helped you tremendously. You've been bold today because you're you're um, speaking to us with a with a very uh, clean background. You've got a white screen, but you've also put up uh, the national flag, and of course, oh. this for a lot of um, mainstream journalists is a great rag to the bull. Um, I, I spent twenty one years in in Her Majesty's Armed Forces in the Navy. And that meant that uh, very often um, at eight o'clock in the morning, I was stood uh, on the deck of a ship saluting uh, the flag in due respect to the monarchy and my country. And I've always found it extremely hard that we, we, we now find ourselves living in a country where to show respect to the national flag is is an indication as far as the bbc is concerned again that you are uh, uh, sorry as far as the bbc is concerned that you're a, a right-wing extremist now you're obviously not squeamish uh, about that charge but you've come in and you've got the i'll call it the union jack over your uh, left shoulder there D tell us did do you have to think about doing this or you simply have decided you're not going to be intimidated I've done this for a few years, actually. I first put a, a flag up behind where I uh, uh, <laughs> did, did videos um, in my, my last place I lived it's sort of four years ago. I, I, I just don't understand it. I, I really don't understand why people associate the, the, our national flag with being far right or whatever. I, I, just, I just simply don't get it. Um, you, you know, but then then you have periods where even the Labour Party, you know, when they come to a campaign, they'll all stand in front of the flag. And it's like, oh, it's OK now, isn't it? When they, when they do it. But when when someone on the right does it, then apparently you're all these kind of things bigoted and and so on that they say and racist and whatever. It, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, what other country would say, oh, if you stand in front of your flag, then that's racist, you know. They wouldn't say that in France or America or Russia or China or Kenya or Nigeria. Everyone's happy to stand in front of their flag. Um, but it's just this country, it seems, that, that you've got the media trying to say that that's a, something morally dubious to do. I just, I, honestly, I, I just don't understand it, really, genuinely don't get it. And I, so I just think, well, I'm going to do it anyway, because uh, I love my country. I want to restore it. I, I think we've got a great future if we can turn things around from the managed decline and the decay that we've had uh, under the parties that we've had in Parliament for the last 25 years or so.
you know we have a great people a wonderful people and all people really need <laughs> well, half of what people need is just for the government to get out of the way and let them be proud of their country and build up their country again so you know well, this is part of the deliberate talking down of our of our culture and our nation to sort of make people ashamed of our country and ashamed of our flag when we've got a lot to be proud of and a lot to be thankful for yeah and I, I, I would absolutely agree with that I'd, I'll just add that I, I've been to the United States a few times um, most recently to to visit family members and if you walk through walk around a residential area uh, very common to see the uh, United States flag flying, mm. you know, above somebody's doorway, and they take mm. it un unbelievably seriously. You're advised not to go mocking the fact that uh, people, you know, across a, a normal residential area will be flying the national flag. But somebody's poisoned our view of our own identity in this country, as you say, that um, if you dare to fly a Union Jack, that automatically makes you some sort of extreme racist now you you just said on the back of that comment from me you just said we need to we need to change the government and this is really getting down into the meat of it i, I what do you think there's a problem in this country i don't want to put words in your mouth there's a problem in this country what are we actually facing what what is the problem in uk in 2023 why have we got all these problems across so many areas you know whether it's the nhs or it's jobs or it's the um the roads are falling to pieces or the rail infrastructure doesn't work or um children are being taught by drag queens or we can't even define a woman what mm. on earth has happened to this country what do you think the problem is yeah, like you say, we're, we're sort of fighting 20 different battles which are visible that we can see um, uh, on every kind of level. Like, you know, the drag queens, the attack on marriage, the attack on masculinity, the immigration, the climate alarmism, the escalation of war in Ukraine. Um, all, all, all these are things that are um, happening that are you know, ruining our country and the structure of our country. But what's behind it? Uh, I, th I think there's maybe you know two or three different things that are interlinked. Um, one of them is cultural Marxism, and I spoke about this a lot back in 2017, 2018. And so you know, um, the understanding people understand that there's something very, very wrong um, with our society, and you know, free speech is going, but not are not really sure what it is. But but cultural Marxism is a deliberate plan to infiltrate all of the institutions that we have and invert their values and principles so whereas before you might have had you know in universities where a lot of them were founded um you know hundreds of years ago and for years and years they taught christianity they taught divinity that was their main subject that when the enlightenment happened they started teaching about natural sciences and physical sciences that's great but now they've been repurposed to teach about um, social justice and how there's all these groups of oppressed people and uh, we need to change society and uh, it fights those people that are perceived to be in power and therefore oppressive. So they are fighting, so, so they're saying women are oppressed by men. Black people are oppressed by white people. Gays are oppressed by uh, Christians. Trans are, trans people are oppressed by everybody. Um, migrants are oppressed by the indigenous population. So then there's all these power structures that they invent and say, well, we need to destroy um, the, the white supremacy. We need to destroy, smash heteronormativity and smash the patriarchy and so on in order to bring about social justice. Um, so that's cultural Marxism in a nutshell. And, uh, you know, sees society as inherently unjust, uh, even though it isn't, and then tries to invert everything. And, uh, and um, you know, that, that corrodes society and collapses it from within. Um, but then, you know, added to that now, I think people have got the understanding that there are these very, very powerful groups of people uh, who are pulling the strings economically as well in things like the World Economic Forum and then even behind them, the big 
global hedge funds like BlackRock and Vanguard and who knows who owns those companies. And, and, and they're interested in totally collapsing societies and, and getting rid of nation states um, so they can introduce a one world government system with just a few corporations and they can control everything and uh, get all the money and get all the resources for themselves. So I think that goes along with cultural Marxism, which actually you know, is based on um, the, the Communist Manifesto, obviously Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto. They say they want to get rid of three things. They want to get rid of families. They want to get rid of nations. They want to get rid, rid of private property. Those are the, the things that the, the Communist Manifesto talks against. Um, cultural Marxism was there to um, slowly corrode the West because there was a lot of resistance to Marxism. That's now almost run its course. And now the people who are the actual Marxists who want to actually get rid of families, nations and private property and take all the private property for themselves are showing their hands. And so we can see that much more obviously now with the World Economic Forum and such groups and uh, their plans um, to introduce total surveillance uh, over the whole globe with a central bank digital currencies, which will be controlled by the Bank of International Settlements in, in uh, Basel. Switzerland, ultimately, that will control everything. Um, so there are those sort of two aspects that are sort of now coming together. I'm still trying to work it all out, but uh, there are definitely some people who are actively trying to um, collapse our nation from inside, not just our nation, but all the nations around the world. David, I would certainly agree with you on that. And I, I can say I've been speaking out on this angle for probably nearly 20 years and in mm -hmm. fact it's getting easier and easier to demonstrate to people that we are being attacked from from the inside uh, uh what came into my mind as you were talking then was of course the world economic forum um put out a little document and video only a few months ago when it was suggesting that in the future you would own nothing and be happy um so mantras like that have not been created by very powerful organizations such as the World Economic Forum for nothing. The, the mantra is being created in order to try and steer people's minds in order to accept what's coming. And uh, as Mike Robinson has pointed out many occasions when Mark Carney was uh, head of the Bank of England, um, he was busy saying if companies don't adopt their green agenda, they will be put out of business. He was as, as aggressive as this. So we see these agencies having more and more power, whether, it, whether it's the World Economic Forum, um, could be the Bilderbergers, although they seem to have slipped into the background a little bit. But we've even got the situation that at the recent Davos meeting, or shortly after the recent Davos meeting, Keir Starmer was being interviewed by Emily Maitland from uh, the, the uh, BBC. And she said to him, well, you've been to, to Davos, you know, um, how does it compare to Westminster? And his response was, well, Westminster's a, a poisonous debating um, pond in which nothing is really achieved. And so she comes back very quickly and says, so which is it, Davos or, or Westminster? And the leader of the Labour Party says, Davos, mm. because I, I'm dealing with people and I can get things done. But what Keir Starmer is talking about is, is acting um, completely out of the constitutional constraints on him as an MP. He's abandoning his constituents to, to whom he should owe his real allegiance and saying, well, I'm going to work with the big boys in, in the World Economic Forum, uh, uh, Davos, in order, to, um, in order to achieve what I think is, is right. So this is reality that you're talking about. This is, this is not a fanciful thing. 
Yeah, and, and it's absolutely appalling that he would say that and even think of saying that, you know, when he's I was speaking to, to you know, the BBC and obviously he knows that millions of people are going to listen to him and he's just so blatantly coming out and saying, yeah, I prefer Davos. Um, well, I, I'm sure it's very nice for him because all these people, they go and, you know, they have nice meals and nice hotels and nice conference centres and, and mix with other people who have got the same agenda, you know, away from all the riffraff. You know, they, they don't have to cope with anyone who disagrees agrees with them or have all these nasty opinions like this <laughs> marriage is a man and a woman for example or or we should allow people to carry on using their petrol and diesel cars and who disagree with all this climate agenda nonsense and uh central bank digital currency that they want to bring in who still want to keep on using cash because we will still want our freedoms and it just shows the absolute disdain that they have for ordinary people that they're that they're, they live in this nice little elite world where they meet and then they think that they can direct the course of life for the 99.9 percent of the world's population that aren't involved in this little elite group that they're part of um it's just absolutely terrible that this is going on but you know as you said as you said you know this goes against our constitution it goes against they don't have the right to do this there is nothing you know in our constitution that says that any foreign well our constitution says and it's in the act of settlement isn't it that no um foreign power should have um any uh Sort of say in, in our nation yeah. whatsoever. I can't remember the exact words, but it's there. I got, got that slightly wrong. But the, no power should be given to any foreign prince, prelate, power, or um, principality, something like that. So, so that includes the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, the European Union, the World Health Organization, even NATO. We shouldn't be giving away any uh, power uh, the, to any of these organizations that they should be able to tell us what we can and cannot do as a nation in any sense whatsoever, either in full or in part. But this just goes totally against that. And um, it, it is it should not be happening. So that's why I say we need a change of government. And so we need to sweep away all of these other parties that are all signed up to Agenda 2030 and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and all these programs that all these supranational um, agencies are involved in pushing and uh, get a party in Parliament which um, will be for the nation and for the people again for the riffraff and, uh, and, uh, rather than to, as they would see it. Not that I see it, but that, that's how the, those people in, in the World Economic Forum would see um, who the people are, how the people are. You can identify um, the source of the problem within, uh, are we allowed to call them the globalists, the likes of Bill Gates that seems to be able to um, mince in and out of, of uh, number 10 uh, as he pleases. Mm. Uh, whether he's talking to Boris Johnson as as was Prime Minister or he's talking to Tony Blair. Um, mm. We have these unaccountable globalists, many of them with immense wealth, who seem to have a very um, polite language, inappropriate influence on national policy within the, the UK. They seem to actually think that they do rule the world because they've got a lot of money. You know, I've spoken to people who who are involved, you know, in the sort of financial investment banking services industry. They actually genuinely do believe that they control everything, that they can move money around and they can force Latvia to do something or they can do this and that's going to force Sri Lanka to do this. They do actually think that they have the right to tell national governments what their policy should be. But they don't, you know, and we, the people, have got to stand up and say, no, we're not having this anymore. Um, but, yeah, it, it's just appalling. As you say, these people swan into London, then they go over to Berlin and then they go to Rome and they seem to tell the uh, people there what the, the next thing on the agenda is that they have to do. And then you see different governments acting in, in in concert, in lockstep together. This was something that people noticed really in the lockdown, you know, that there was this was being brought in at exactly the same time in Canada, in 
in the UK, in Germany, in New Zealand. All these things sort of seem to happen at exactly the same time. They even use the same language and the same phrases. You know, you probably mentioned this, that the whole build back better thing, that people don't say that much anymore, but that was suddenly a week when everyone was starting to say this, like it was a new um, spell, a new phrase that they were putting out into the consciousness to try to get people to accept something um, all at the same time. So, yeah, this is going on. It's very clear now. It's very obvious. It's not conspiracy theory because it's right out in the open so everyone can see it. And, um, you know, as it's there, it's easier for people to say, look, do we want this? No, we don't. Let's vote for somebody in Parliament that can overturn this and get our nation back. A really crunchy question. David, you were elected, you've been elected Prime Minister. What what would what would you go for initially? How how would you uh, you attempt to sort out the mess in this country? There's so many things to be done very, very quickly, but obviously we'd have a programme for the first hundred days and what we'd want to do is um stop the migration across the channel we'd stop you know get some grappling hooks push the boats back to france we would stop uh rse going into schools and we would stop this um brainwashing of children which is going on uh and all the drag queen story hours and all this kind of filth that's going to children we'd stop that we would um get the budget back on track and stop wasting money on all kinds of things like subsidies for wind and solar and HS2 and foreign aid and migrant hotels and actually use the money to be building up the schools and the police and health service. So we need to turn the budget around very, very quickly. Um, we would need to... Um, start rebuilding our energy infrastructure as well and part of that would be to uh one of one of the first things we'd have to do would be to repeal the climate change act and all this net zero nonsense so then there would be no um obligation on any councils to put in policies and their plans which are going to go along with net zero so we would start to then use our coal and oil and gas resources to bring the price of energy back down, which in turn would feed into building up businesses. It would lower um, costs for households. So the economy would start to grow again because of that. And we would also um, remove the, the crazy sanctions we've got on Russia. Um, which actually are not hurting Russia, but they're hurting the West um, more than anything, so that we can um, get cheap Russian gas for in the short term while we build our energy infrastructure um, to rebuild our economy over the medium term. Uh, and along with that, we would need to you know, do the other things that I think we need to do um, socially. I mean, there, there are two things, as I said, we are a socially conservative party. And a couple of the things we would want to do uh, quite quickly is restore marriage to being a man and a woman and to abolish abortion. Um, whereby 220,000 unborn children every year are killed in this country, uh, which is it is a horrible holocaust. And we would want to stop that uh, quite quickly as well. So those would be some of the things that we would do um, in our first uh, 100 days. You quickly and appropriately, because family is a key part, you've said family is one of the three key key areas for the Heritage Party. Um, so you're focusing in on some quite simple, controversial, but simple things within society. Um, language is certainly being attacked at the moment. And and mm. I, I'm old enough now to think back and let's say to the 80s, if I go back in the 80s, was life di different? It was definitely calmer. Um, people weren't wor worried what sex they were. They automatically knew, and therefore they could get on with their jobs. They weren't worried about pronouns and this sort of thing. So I find it interesting that you, in your, you're saying your 100 days, you're going to concentrate on some really quite simple issues as, as a way of starting to pick away at the bigger problems. And um, you also mentioned Russia, and I thought, oh, well, this is this is interesting because I can imagine a sucking of teeth in the BBC. Um, how do you view the the war in Ukraine? 
that's a, a major event at the moment. There, there's there's a there's a good thing, isn't it? If the, if the BBC is for something, it's a good indication that the, what they're saying is wrong, and the opposite opinion to the BBC is correct. I mean, I've been saying from the beginning, this is crazy. This is a war that didn't need to ever happen, but the West has been pushing it because we have been. Uh, arming the um, Azov battalion, etc., the Ukrainian forces for eight years and enabling them to kill and shell ethnic Russians in the Donbass region for eight years, breaking the Minsk agreements, which were put in in place in, in 2014 in order to secure a, a peace uh, and a stability in Ukraine after the Western um, backed and instigated coup that they had in 2013, 2014. So I'm against escalating this. It's something that NATO countries should didn't even need to get involved in. I mean, it was it was essentially a special military operation uh, to s stop Russians being killed in eastern Ukraine. But the West has escalated and escalated. Uh, you had crazy statements at the beginning by Liz Truss saying that she would support British people going out and fighting in Ukraine. I mean, that, 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 where on earth was that coming from? But it's just escalated. Now they're talking about tanks. Now they're talking about airplanes. It, Rishi Sunak's talking about giving the UK is going to be the first country to give Ukraine long range missiles, you know, which could potentially shoot into Russia itself. I mean, where do they want to go with this? It looks like they actually want a hot war with Russia, uh, which is insane. So, you know, from the very beginning, I've been saying de-escalate, talk, negotiate, end the war, end the killing, stop imposing sanctions. Let's just get back to sanity and where we were 10 years ago, where the Western countries and Russia were building a good relationship and building trade and building friendship with each other. Where's that gone? For what reason? For what purpose is this gone? It's the wrong future for the world for the West to be enemies with Russia. We need to be, you know, get back to being partners, uh, trading partners with Russia, if not friends. That's what I think anyway. Well, of course, the, the policy's all gone or, or the policy's been skewed in the minds of the, the globalists that, that we've just mentioned, I think. Um, but that's, that's a pretty powerful response there. And uh, I don't think many people could disagree with the concept that we need to wind the war down and stop the killing i i, I would hope mm. that all of our viewers and listeners would agree uh, would agree with that we're just coming up to to the hour david so um you've got the audience what would you like to say to the audience give them the pitch why should uh, um, uk column viewers or other people that come across this video why should they get involved with the heritage party well, we, we do have a full manifesto, which you can see. Uh, we, we started up, um, was it, two and a half years ago when there was nothing going on in this sort of area of politics. And, you know, uh, so we, we started up because we, we need a party that is socially conservative, that stands for our nation, restoring our nation, uh, family values and freedom. And we encompass all of those things um, together. But I can only build this with the help of an army of people. So I'm hoping that people watching this and who see me around, uh, you know, on social media will join the Heritage Party because everyone who joins, it helps me and it helps the candidates that we have to continue standing in elections and fighting elections and giving people an alternative that is not Tory, Labour, Lib Dem and Green. So if we don't make a challenge politically, we're going to keep on getting the same thing that we've always had before and the same parties that are running our nation down. So please do come and join me in the Heritage Party. And if, you, if you're if you a member, you can also apply to become a candidate as well. And this really is the time this month to make a decision as, as to whether to become a candidate or not, because um, you've got to get your papers into the council by the end of, of March, essentially, um, for the elections in May. So this is election season. Now is the best time to join us, to get involved in the party, to get involved in the candidates, be a candidate, support candidates, help to make the change in politics that you want to see in the country. Thank you. <laughs> and you can join us at heritageparty.org uh, if you like.
uh, it's it's been a pleasure to speak to you today. So I'm going to wish you success and I shall watch carefully and uh, see how it goes.